Welcome everyone. Super excited to see all your faces. My name is Taylor George and I use she, her pronouns and I am one of the program planning and development chair ELEX for our KUAI's Black Professionals Network. So thank you for joining us today's roundtable session. Um, it's a collaboration between the Women in Housing Network and BPN or Black Professionals Network. So in honor of Women's History Month, the Black Professional Network and Women in Housing Network are hosting a Black Women in Housing panel to discuss transitioning to or navigating mid-level leadership as a Black woman in housing. So our moderator today for this session is Deanna C. Hughes, who's currently at Florida State, who will further introduce herself, explain their current role, and then assist with introducing our panelists for today. So I'll pass it over to you, Deanna. Thank you, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. I am Deanna C. Hughes. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the pleasure of serving as an assistant director for Conduct and Care at Florida State University. Um, it is an honor to be a moderator for this session, and I'm excited for this time of engagement with you all. Um, shout out to those who shared some questions when registering, um, and know that as time permits, we will engage those as well as get the ball rolling. Um, but enough about me and all of that fun. Um, what I want to do now is open the floor to our panelists who essentially stated, I am willing and able to be here in this space with us. So what I'm going to do is drop their names in the chat. And in this order, if you all could introduce yourself, be greatly appreciated. Um, so you should be able to see starting with Paige. Um, and we can flow in that order before we get into the questions. That sounds like a plan. All right, let's go. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am super excited to spend some time and share space with you all this after this sunny afternoon in Texas. And so my name is Paige Hicks. I use she or hers pronouns. Um, I'm an assistant director at the University of Texas at Austin, um, and I've been in housing for a few years now. And so to share a little bit about my um, journey, I think I started getting with getting involved in um, my call council, then becoming an RA went to grad school. So anybody who's in Kansas, Rock Chalk. And then I started my professional journey at the University of South Florida, where I was able to engage and connect and learn a lot. And so I'm excited to learn and also engage with you on this space. Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Mika Kakari. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And I serve as the Associate Director in Resident Education and Development at the University of Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati is my hometown. I love it. Um, I've been in housing for about seven years, but I've been a higher ed professional for about um, 15 years in different roles outside of housing, orientation, career center, learning center, academic advising, um, and but started my housing career as a resident assistant and RA and undergrad, and that led me to be back in housing and loving it. So I guess I'm kind of a res lifer. I'm super excited to be here, share this space, um, particularly with um, other Black women. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole, her pronouns, and I am one of the assistant directors in the Office of Residential Education at Wagner College in Staten Island, New York. Um, I've been in house about five years. Um, I started with a couple of internships, um, actually through a cool first, and then um, separately at another institution in Maryland. And I think my journey into housing, I would was very much into student activities. Um, but thanks to my Akuwai internship, I realized, okay, maybe I do want to be in housing. Um, and so I've been in my assistant director role for here this past January. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dominique Simmons. I'm one of the assistant directors for residence education at Mississippi State University. Um, so I've kind of been in housing a little bit over maybe 10 years. I started as an undergrad student. Um, at Jackson State University, uh, where I fell in love with student affairs, Greek life, student activities, all of those things. And so I decided to continue on with my graduate program here at Mississippi State. And then I did my first professional job in Alabama. So super excited to be here with you all and share some experiences and, and, and get to know everyone. Thank you so much. 
Good afternoon. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, I see the green bubble blinking. So I am coming through clear, loud and clear. My name is Kiana Stone. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I serve as the Director for Housing and Auxiliary Services at Governor State University. This is a new role. We are a month and a half in. Uh, we are located in University Park, um, just right outside of the city of Chicago here in the great state of Illinois. Um, in addition to that, I am currently the past president for Gukuho, since we are in the housing sphere, um, finishing up my final track of the tri-presidency. And um, my journey, I guess, and my connection to housing and res life um, this year would make as of postmasters year 18. I'm like, what did the time go? Black don't crack. I'm still looking great. You know, and it, it has not broken me in my postmasters life that I have spent my whole time within um, the housing and residence life era, um, having previously served at DePaul University in the Department of Residential Education, prior to that at Eastern Illinois University. And I did my undergrad and graduate work at Indiana University in, Bloom in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I'm a first gen college student. And so as a first gen professional, really got my connection there of being a student leader and kind of finding a job because I was that student with three, four jobs at any given time. And one of those jobs landed me working in the Department of Residential Education, well, Department of Residential Programs and Services, excuse me, um, working in the housing assignments office for our camps and conference director and over our housing and dining um, and Continue to kind of get that bug as often you went through your five stages of grief that this is going to be your life. I went through the denial of all of those things and then finding my way. And now here we are in 2023. Hello, my name is Shanice Williams, pronouns are she, hers, um, and I'm the Assistant Director of Housing and Residence Life um, at the University of Texas at Tyler. Um, and so my job more entails more so on the residence education side. Um, I got my start pretty traditionally. Um, I was an RA in undergrad, um, and I, I went through those stages of grief of like, I'm never, you know, going to stay in residence. Like, well, what is that, right? And then when the opportunity presented itself for uh, me to be professionally um, in the Department of Housing and Residence Life, I took it, and it was a great opportunity for me to also um, get my master's and now get my doctorate as well. So um, I just kind of took those continued steps, and now I think I'm on the portion of acceptance at this point. So <laughs> it is nice to be here and share this space with you all. Thank you to each and every single one of you for giving us that snapshot of your amazing journey. Um, so if it's cool with you all, we're going to get right into some questions. Um, so the first one I have, and I'm going to copy and paste so that everyone can view as I'm reading, um, is for you to share what are some things that have allowed you to be successful as you have advanced within your career in university housing? And what challenges have you faced uh, specifically? How did you work through them? So, you know, we like to ask questions with a three and one. Um, so what are those things that have allowed you to be successful? What were the challenges and how did you work through them? Um, I, can, I guess I'll start. So I, what, what's funny is that a lot of people, once they meet me, they think my master's is in higher ed. It is not. This was not the plan. I told y'all, I was like, mm, this is not, I don't know if this is what I want to do. And so in thinking about that, my master's is in public affairs. So I did a double concentration in public and nonprofit net management. By that point in grad school, I went from undergrad straight to graduate school and thought, this might be it. And so I was a grad hall director. I was never an RA. And so at IU, they have their own um, language and nomenclature. So I was a grad supervisor, aka ARD. Um, and in that, I let the imposter complex get the best of me. And I said, I'm not sure if, and, I, and also traveling, I am really in uncharted territory because no one else in my immediate household had been to college. And 
navigating if the high, if the HESA program was for me, did I have what it take to get in? What I knew was a school of public and environmental affairs, knowing that my bachelor's was in public administration, uh, public administration, I did public health track and learned about the MPA. And I said, okay, public institution, public affairs. If I wake up one day and I don't like kids, I can easily pivot. And, and that was my, my thinking, because at the end of the day, this is a business. While we talk about theory and all of those things, it's still a business. And so that was the little sister, if you will, to the MBA, getting an MPA. And that's what I chose to do. Um, but then everything that I did from my capstone to my grad assistantship, I encapsulated into the world of higher ed, look specifically housing and residence life. Um, when I set out to job search, I did the Oshkosh Placement Exchange and really thought about what will be that first job or that department and institution that is going to complement what I already know, that is going to really invest in me and really think about um, translating the idea of theory and supervision and student development. And I found myself at Eastern Illinois University. I said, I'm going to Mayberry, Jesus. And so, but I fell in love with the institution and they had a really great team in place that really focused on what is the professional development plan? What is the experience you want to get? And I was very blessed to be able to have that in place and work alongside some great co um, colleagues that understood that my skills were transferable. I could talk the talk and walk the walk. I just needed a shot. And so, um, and I had already done a lot of that through student leadership and through other projects that I was able to take on um, with focusing on that. And so I think that that kind of helped. I think the challenge in that, at least at that time, was that some institutions and some programs were, if you don't have a higher ed degree, we're not looking at you, period. I think that where we are in 2023 is that, and especially post this panorama pandemic that we're in, that we understand that there is a need for more. Theory is only gonna get you so far, but when we are looking at an enrollment cliff, when we are looking at, we are throwing sometimes the mission on the back burner and it's about beds and heads and how to be strategic, you see that more folks are coming in with an MBA. Some folks are coming in with some more of that business aspect. And so we are a little more open to that because I can teach you theory. I can teach you how to create a programming model, a residential curriculum. But that business piece and understanding how to make this budget work and how to make dollars make sense when we take, we're cutting more money and cutting budgets and slashing programs, but we're doing more with less got to have a different kind of mindset. And so I think that that was sometimes some of the challenges um, that I think I faced, but was easily able to find those spaces and then have that conversation with my supervisor about here's what my gap in the market is. Here's what I think I'm missing. How can I best complement what that looks like for me? Thank you for sharing that, Kiana. Um, Paige, I want to say I saw you earlier. I didn't know if you wanted to add to some of the great points that were made. Yeah, Kiana, you dropped a lot of good notes. And so something I definitely want to echo is when you were talking to people to really understand your experience. And so something I think that's really helped me to be successful along the way is really developing a board of directors and knowing when to go to where for and for what and what I'm looking for. At times, it's just guidance. And so that's where a mentor has come into play. So I really appreciate it, really getting connected with folks, even in this space, but in other cool life circles and even outside of this as well. Um, even looking at sponsorship, because also my name has been spoken at other tables that I'm not involved. And so what does it mean to transparently share? What am I looking for? What, what do I need to grow and develop? And with that, with the like board of directors, I really appreciated them because sometimes they give you the two finger tap, like Paige, I need you to grow in this, or I think I need you to think about taking like the leaps of faith. And so, um, and really thinking about taking those leaps, they challenged me to really build my skill set and really think about scope. And so I've taken on projects. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'm interested in that, 
but from taking on some of those projects, I've had an opportunity maybe to go to China to do a housing study tour or to work with university legal to understand our practices and policies that really set me up for my next steps as I'm looking to advance in housing. I just kind of want to piggyback off that because I do agree. I think for me, my village has been, that has been like my biggest thing and that's village with family, friends, um, mentors, people in housing, people in student affairs because I have had some challenges, you know, and most of my challenges have been when I have, I guess I would say got promoted to the next level because when I first came out of grad school, I wanted to do so much. And my first professional job was like, no, that's not how it's done. Like, so I got real, I got hit real quick with politics real fast. And so learning how to, to navigate that coming out of grad school, you can't do everything. I'm not going to be able to, you know, help every student. And I have a mental health background. And so my degree is in counseling. And so I'm always, I want to help people as much as I can. I'm also a first gen college student, but also when that politics started getting and played a little bit more, I had to learn how to navigate, you know, as a first-time professional. And then got moved up to assistant director. That's a whole nother level, you know, of trying to figure it out how to navigate that, even supervising professional staff. And so really having my village, you know, being able to, you know, confide in my family, being able to call one of my old supervisors, like, how did you navigate this? How can I continue to grow? Um, being willing to be open to feedback, and so I'm always open to feedback. I never, like, I know everything, you know. I have, you know, my current director, I sit down with her and ask her questions too. Like, how do you navigate supervising, you know, this group or working with GRDs? Because it's like, once you feel like you master something, then when you move up, it's, you have to learn it all over again. And so for me, that's kind of been some challenges that I've been kind of like working through. I love this. And I also love how it, seems to naturally have transitioned into our next couple questions. Uh, so starting with Dr. Karkari, is it okay if I have a skip to the one that actually talked about campus politics, different institution types? Let's go panelists. Okay, so as we may or may not know, um, higher education systems can be complex and require the ability to navigate campus politics, right? Uh, so what are some of the lessons um, that have been helpful through your journey, navigating different institutions, politics. And I'm gonna do a, a little layer because we've also naturally talked about the intersectionality, right? Of being a black woman in these spaces. So um, as you're answering, what are some of those lessons or things that you have been, have been helpful through your journey, navigating different institutions, politics? Um, keep that lens in mind of the intersectionality of what makes you you. I'm happy to jump in and I'll just, it's, um, so Dr. Kakari, it's how you pronounce my last name. I just like to let people know my husband's from Ghana. Um, I know it looks like Kerry Kerry, um, but it's pronounced Kakari. Um, so I'll just share that. I, I think a couple of things. One, when you think about intersectionality, I think something I've had to kind of navigate as a leader is, is this happening to me because I'm black? Is this happening to me because I'm a woman? Is this happening to me because I'm a black woman? Is this happening to me because I look young? Because black don't crack? Like, 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 what, what is the thing? Why am I getting this pushback? Why is my white, you know, colleague not getting the same pushback that I'm getting um, about the same thing? Why is everything got to be an issue? Why is everything a fight? You know, I give you a hundred dollars, you, you mad that it ain't two hundred. Um, and so I just think that like what people don't realize sometimes is the mental gymnastics I'm doing all the time, just in whatever space I'm in. And so the words that come out of my mouth, it's like, I've already thought, been real thoughtful about it. Um, so, so I think that that's one point. The other point about like, um, navigating politics is the longer I've been in the field is that every hill isn't one I'm going to die on. And so I think when I was a younger professional and right in, I wanted to burn the whole place down and everything was a fight and fight the power. I'm trying to do the long game. You know, I got two kids. I got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Diapers are expensive. And so I, I need this job. And so, and I want to be here. And so to me, it doesn't mean I'm not going to push, but to me, it's about being strategic. It's about being like, I'm going to, 
you know, th this battle ain't worth fighting or it's not worth me winning because I'm thinking about the war. I'm thinking about the long term. Um, and so some of the ways I've been able to navigate that is about listening, not always having to be the one to speak up and talk like, but let me just sit and soak in. Let me see who the players are at the table. Let me see who I need to get on my team, who I need to invite to coffee um, so that they know my name and I can they can be an ally for me. And so those are some of the lessons I've learned um, as I kind of continue to grow as a Black woman leader in housing. Um, I would love to piggyback on that. That was amazing, first of all. Um, I think everybody was nodding their head like, that's, that's me. That is me. That's a word, right? <laughs> um, but I would say even on top of that, knowing that I don't only represent myself, but I represent so many other Black women in housing and residence life too, or just at a university in general. And so taking those moments to listen um, and also taking the elevator back down to pick up another young Black woman. I think one of the challenges that I had when I first came in is I didn't see a lot of women or women in general that looked like me, period. Um, so multi-generational mentorship was not there. Um, and I had to figure things out on my own, but now navigating these campus politics and, and figuring out what rooms can I say something in, what rooms can't I say something in, or how do I, you know, navigate that? For me, it's saying, okay, I did not have that, but now it's my turn to bring up another young Black woman and say, well, this is how you navigate it. And I'm not saying that and saying you need to change who you are as a person. I'm never saying that, but let me, let me kind of guide you into this is how this person speaks and this is how this room works um, because I want you to be successful as well. And so um, I, I loved your points and I just wanted to kind of add that on there as well. I was gonna say something that I, I try to tell my team, especially um, my staff, my RDs, because I wish it was something that somebody told me and that I would have paid better attention to. We will navigate at our institutions and our department to all the fun things. We don't never wanna show up for the stuff that's not the sexy job, okay? We don't wanna sit on those committees like assessment, but I will tell you in a month and I, I hate assessment, okay? But I understand the need and the necessary for it. And I told my former boss anecdotally that in my month and a half of being here, I said, I've asked more assessment S type questions than I have in my whole life, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's necessary. But I also said, thank you, because when there was a gap, and somebody needed to be voluntold to go sit on the assessment committee, that was me. And I spent that time understanding and learning how the machine works. Yeah, and, and that is always my saying to them. I said, you got to understand how the machine works. I said, before you go try to burn it down, push back, push buttons and all the things, how does the machine work? How does the institution work? What spaces do you have access to? What is in your locus of control to sit and just go and listen? My boss um, had to change a meeting just last week. He said, oh, can we change this meeting? The president is speaking at the, um, at the state um, and going before the state to seek funding for um, our institution and being able to tell our story. All the Illinois public institutions were just at Springfield you know, before the board answering the questions. He said, it's a live video hearing. Do you want the copy? Yes, please. Send me the link. I'll tune in, I especially when if I don't have to show up and it's a video. Okay. But it's because I'm learning how the machine works. What are the priorities? How is she telling the story of Governor State? And what is the ask? So, because eventually all of that is going to trickle down to me. And that is the thing that we don't, depending on where we are, especially when we're in an entry level role, we only are focused, maybe divisional department, a division. And we miss all of those emails that have to do with larger university system things. And that, because we busy in, in our space, doing our, hopefully doing our job, you know, meeting all our immediate metrics, but leaving time to be able to understand how the machine works because you don't know what those little sound bites, because we collect things when we connect connect knowledge. And it is a, such a moment to be able to be a standout to say, well, I know that blah, 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 blah is happening. Where do you get that information from? Because I listened to, 
our president tell these legislators X, Y, Z? Because I've made my little notes and then my next meeting, I said, so when y'all was going to tell me we did A, B, and C, or could I get the background? How do you know that? Because I was listening. I was paying attention. I was in a space you didn't expect me to be in. So those state of the university meetings, RSVP and show up. You know, when the president is doing those addresses, RSVP and show up, you know, of those spaces, because you won't, one, see a lot of other people on your level across university there, but that matters. So that way you are better prepared when you get the opportunity to go and be a director, then because there is no training at the director level. There is no onboarding structure. And so you need to have those moments where you're guided, as we had talked about earlier with those mentors and that board, so you can ask your questions while you're in your now so that you prepare for your later. And I wanna kind of agree with that because I do think showing up and I know we, I, I sometimes still suffer from imposter syndrome. I think I, maybe I'm not supposed to be in that space, but I try to like, don't me get out your head. You're supposed to be there. If they ask you to be there, if they sent it to you, it's for you, you know? And so I try to show up. I try to learn all of like, how does this system work? How does that area work? I want to know, even with the student staff selection side, look like, give me the HR stuff. I just want to be able to know. So if I do get that question, I can be able to answer. And I can also help people behind me because I'm real big on mentorship as well. And I know we talked about being in your head so much. I'm always thinking about, Dominique, how do I say this so they won't think that I am being mean or I'm being the angry black woman? Because sometimes me saying something and disagreeing, my coworker, not currently, to say the same thing. And it's like, oh, that's just so great. And I'm like, I literally just said that. But now I'm the one who looks like, like I'm being the conflict in the room. And I'm not being the conflict in the room. I guess it's just, and then that's when I start thinking about, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm a black woman? y'all see me as like, you know, loving hip hop black women on TV or something. Like I'm always trying to be mean, but I'm just trying to voice my concerns when it's time for me to bring up a conflict. Cause I'm never scared to bring up something that I don't agree with, but I have to now think about how do I say it sometimes, but I'm never not going to be myself. But sometimes I do be in my head thinking like, how do I need to say this? What's the word, words to say? So people won't think I'm just, you know, coming out too strong or coming out so mean um, in that space. Yeah, this is some real talk. Um, I'm being started in all the right ways. I'm hearing strategy. I'm seeing the value of networking, um, the vulnerable realities of how to navigate. Um, Dominique, thank you for saying that. Dr. Karkari, thank you for saying what you said. Like, is it because of? Because I saw so much affirmation. Um, the chat is lit. And I'm grateful for that because the affirmation is clearly needed and appreciated. Um, and I love how we naturally kind of transition into just like that strong black woman syndrome. Um, so in recognizing that time is always that thing that gets away from us. I'm also feeling a part two. Yes, I put the plug in. So um, y'all be prepared for that, that ask because this is some good rich information, um, but we know an hour is never enough time to really get into some of the things. Um, but Nicole, if you don't mind jumping us off, um, so for most of us who really know about it, strong Black superwoman syndrome is often used to describe women who feel obligated to help others, suppress their emotions, manifest strength, and resist appearing vulnerable, often leading to unrealistic expectations in the workplace. Um, how have you been able to set personal and professional boundaries in your current role? I think a lot of what we've already talked about is like being in my own head and trying to make sure that I'm wearing there, paying attention to what's going on around me and talking. Um, so it's been a challenge. I've definitely like worked. My next options could be as and making sure that I'm in this space because I'm capable of doing this work. Um, so constantly working on setting those boundaries is a challenge. This isn't recognizing what hill I wanna actually die on. Do I want to put 
everybody's going to care. But then at the same time, why, why I'm in this field why is because of the impact of other people I was underneath as an undergrad. The impact that they had on me is what brought me. And even on those toughest, say, toughest days, I'm like, all right, these students are why I'm here. I want them to be successful. So I need to get out of my own head. I need to set myself up for success so that I can set them up for success. Because at the end of the day, like it's most important for them. Can I um, add on to that as well? So uh, Joan Morgan has this book called When Chicken Has Come Home to Roost. And there is this chapter on there um, in the book that talks about that strong black woman syndrome. And she talks about we need to sometimes put that cape up because it does more damage to us than than good, right? So black, strong black woman, we know tired, we know running, we know saving, we know everything else, but we don't know rest. We don't know easy. Um, and sometimes we don't know honesty for ourselves and to those around us. And so for me, I've had, I've had to have those conversations with myself of, hey, I'm tired and I'm burnt out, right? Um, Zora Neale Hurston says, if you are silent about your pain, people will kill you and say that you enjoyed it, right? And I don't want that to happen. I want people to know that I'm at my wit's end. And so for me, it's making sure is being a strong black woman more important than me being alive or me being happy or me having a cup that's full to be able to give to other people. And so that's what I've really been having to work on. And it's still a, a constant uh, battle, I think for any of us, right? That wanna be successful and wanna be there for others. But I would say definitely holding those boundaries and being honest with myself and those around me. I'm sorry if I'm really passionate. <laughs> no, that's good. Well, one, don't apologize. That's like so good. Like we show people and that you can be strong without like killing yourself. Like being strong is saying no. It's being like enough is enough. Um, And that like you can be a strong black woman without like, I don't need to light myself on fire to keep everybody else around me warm. And I think that we can kind of fall. I won't even say we, I can fall into that trap as a black woman that feels like I got to do all the things. Like I always feel like I'm not doing enough. You know, I'm on this committee. I'm doing that. I've got my PhD, but then I still feel like, Oh, if I could just do more, or be a better professional or mom or wife. And it's like, I've done it all. Um, but I also have found, and I don't know if other people feel this way, but that like, as a black woman, I can sometimes feel like I have this pressure to be over accommodating so that I'm not seen as, the, as this angry black woman. And so I'm over accommodating because God forbid I'm passionate because now I'm mad or got an attitude when it's like, and so I feel like that over accommodation is then I'm doing too much. I'm giving too much. I'm expected to just keep it all together. Be happy Mika. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I've struggled with that. And so I'm trying to be better so that I can be a great mom to my young kids. So I could be a great example to the people that come behind me to know that like you're enough and like you don't need to burn yourself out to be a great professional. You can leave at five and still contribute well um, to your job. I really love that you talked about that over accommodating piece. Um, I think for me, my wake up call, I've heard about the putting on the cape, but I've watched my mother and my grandmother, they don't take days off. We are always constantly working. But there was an article released by NASPA, I want to say last year, and it really looked at, looked at the experiences of Black women who are SHOs in these high level positions at the universities um, and some of the things that they were experiencing. They felt like they had to over accommodate in places so people could understand them. And they had to put in more hours so their work was seen as valuable. And in return, a lot of those people in, those, in that study were starting to develop some physical things where now they have things they can't take back. And that scares me reading because I only have one body. And if I die tomorrow, they will post my position. I have I'm watching it, hiring jobs. It, I remember during COVID, it was like, oh my God, there's only 200 jobs. But the other day, there are 900 jobs posted. And I think that was my wake up call that I have to take time to take care of myself during this time. And so even if that is 30 minutes to an hour, let me go walk, let me go work out because I can't think about y'all when I'm trying to get through this next set or this next trip. Yeah, and I, I wanted to kind of, because I, I, I read a book very similar, um, Shanice. Mine's with the book I'm reading with my line sisters right now is called Hood Feminism. And it's talking about, oh, you read that book? Look, I saw, yeah, it's a really good book. And we are on this chapter. We were just on the chapter like last week about strong Black women and how honestly it is a negative connotation and we shouldn't even be glorifying. It should not be glorified to be a strong Black woman only because 
you don't have strong black, like strong white women, you know, and so that's really kind of putting us in a situation to where our safety net to fail is gone. And so you have to constantly put on this cape. You have to constantly do so much. Like I'm a mom. I'm getting my doctorate. Be done this summer. Thank goodness. It has been a lot, <laughs> you know, but I'm also assistant director trying to do, you know, different jobs, trying to juggle a whole bunch of stuff. And I had a person, a student, asked, they said, Dominic, you know what? You're just so strong. I'm like, that's not what I want you to see is me having to do all of this with a smile on my face. And I have to be honest with them sometimes. Like it is hard, you know, and I have to kind of like navigate through what's more important at a certain time. Because sometimes I, I have to say no a lot. Like if I have to go take my daughter to gymnastics, it's I got to no, I can't do work right now because my personal life, her gymnastics is important. She loved that little class, you know. Even if I have to stay up a little bit later to do a paper, but that's still not good because that's me taking away from my self-care or I might have to take off to go do self-care. And so I have to also get them to see the other side and not always glorify being this strong black woman that people hold us to so much because they feel like we can do it all. But we should also be able to say, you know, I'm tired too. Or can I have some help? Can somebody help me? Or can you know, can I depend on you as well? So don't don't think I don't need anybody to depend on, you know, um, because I do. And so I did want to bring up that book because we just got done talking about that in our book, book club. Right. Don't be the, the Black woman. And then for me, the plus size, because I'm a little thick, right? And Black woman. And then all the connotations and, and things like that. I was like, oh, you're intimidating. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that, right? And all the things. I think beginning with the end in mind, like when we start a new job or before we say yes to the new job, you know, going over what's the expectations? Because these are my expectations. And the no, for me, is knowing the difference of when I can be ambitious and when I can be realistic. Because I know I need rest. But that rest is not going to come during move in. You are not going nowhere. You're going to be there. <laughs> You're going to be there. But when move in is over, oh, hey, you know, after Labor Day, I'm going I'm to take my rest and labor. OK. And so thinking about those times of not coming in hot, but, you know, thinking about, all right, when what's reasonable and when can I be reasonable and asking those questions of what are the expectations, you know, that knowing that sometimes it may be some late nights. So then does, does that mean a later morning, you know, or maybe I need to sacrifice on the end. I may be coming in for an early morning so then I can have an early leave of when that happens, you know, or the preparation. This something that I've been thinking about of, you know, we take our vacation days or hopefully we are taking vacation days, but I need a, a pre-prepare for the vacation and I need a post-prepare for the va uh, vacation. So I need to build in, I don't want to go, tr I'm trying to do better of, if I'm going to take my days off, I need to build in a prepared date to go back. Because what's the point of taking all of those days off to then go immediately by all the rest and the buildup and the rejuvenation go ooze out? Like I need to ease back into it and I need to ease out of it, you know, because I don't I find that I have find myself working up until the 11th hour and then I'm like still wound up going into my vacation day because now out of I've done all the things and then I didn't and then I'm running at the last minute doing packing on bags doing the laundry because cleaning my house and if I'm leaving and going somewhere because you know we don't leave a uh, leave we come back to a clean house right and so that's in our DNA that our ancestors taught us that right that brings in the good vibes you know so then that way thinking about that so that might mean I need to do some personal work on myself on the front end and then preparing on the back end so that I'm just, I'm ready to go. Because having that upfront conversation with my supervisor and my leadership, I'm going to come back being my best self and being able to give my best if I can figure out what's the best window for me to do that balance. And we don't think about that. I hope y'all taking notes, people. Look. Um, I will reshare some things because one of the questions was for us to have our amazing panelists give advice. They've been dropping gems since the start. Um, so if you miss some of this, let me repeat. Begin with the end in mind. Yes. Have you a board of directors, people, whether it's your mentor, 
Mama now, because I believe in that, right? When we think about who we are and why we are, we cannot forget our foundation with or without degrees. Embracing rest, being okay with being vulnerable to allow for students to recognize we ain't always got the cape on. We appreciate you. And we're also going to embrace rest, prioritize the things that matters in your life. Um, so in case y'all missed it, there we go. It's also recorded. So I'm excited about being able to share this to, for those who were not present with us. Um, what I wanted to do is to provide space, right, for folks who are actively with us in this moment. Um, I do have three questions, um, but what I'm going to do is present the first one. And if anybody has additional questions, you can direct message myself or Michelle. And as time permits within this eight to 10 minutes we got to work with, we're gonna move from there. That sounds like a plan. Let's go. Okay, so the first one I saw um, was, when there are so many hands stirring the pot and it talked about facilities, accounting, student affairs, leadership, et cetera, Within residence life, when all of these hands are stirring in the pot, how does a manager make sure their voice continues to be heard and the vision maintained? Um, so that was the first one that I'm going to drop so y'all can read and see. Um, and whoever feels compelled to speak to that one, just jump right on in. Um. I can start it off. I think for me, always making sure that I have the students in mind, right? So we are all here um, for these students and their time on campus, whether that is heads and beds, whether that is a residential curriculum, you know, whatever it is. So making sure that um, when there are these different hands in the pots, making sure that I have space to say, but what do our students want? What do our students need? What does this next generation of students look like, right? Um, and so just being open and honest to that, because sometimes um, you are in rooms where they have no recollection of housing and residence life. We are a special group of people, right? And so some people don't even understand our world, but always making sure we're bringing it back to, you know, we are here for the students um, and they are a part of our stakeholder group. And so how are these decisions affecting them as well? And can we as staff members adequately give them what we have um, in this space? So that's what I'll kind of start that off with. Second that, I have not been a part of these conversations, but uh, my colleague, we're getting ready to do a lot of construction on our So thinking about what are the students actually going to like? What do we want to offer? I have not directly been a part of those conversations, but I echo what Shanice has said. In the few conversations I have had part in, we need to be the ones feeling in this or they haven't even thought about students so it's wait what what about this like let's try this um but i think i would also stress and i don't know i hope that everyone is fortunate enough to have a supportive supervisor um but if you we talk being and showing up if you someone else is speaking your name in that space or gives you that invitation to get to that space up on that behalf because that's incredibly important as well um, I think I've taken a lot of advantage from that and have also been fortunate enough that our VP round also, um, who has a little bit of housing background also has spoken on our behalf to be like, wait, let's think about this. So I think that board of directors, that support system, that supervisor has always been helpful for sure. And I echo all of those. And I just want to add in the not so pretty part assessment. When you bring those numbers, can't nobody, t I mean, make sure you do it correctly <laughs> and have, you know, correct sample size and all that stuff. But when you bring in the numbers, the numbers tell itself. And so I always use uh, my assessment. I And it could be because I'm the assessment uh, assistant director, but I like assessment. So to me, it's pretty side of the job because <laughs> your numbers don't lie. And so when you have the facts, you lead with the facts. I will quickly add, because I was going to talk about making data-driven decisions, um, coalition building has been helpful for me. And so I have been able to identify at this point, there are going to be some people I need to massage before the meeting or get their input before the meeting so they feel like they are heard in that space. So when something new is introduced or something that, that may differ from what they may not want, they've already had time to ruminate and think about it. That's that's what I was going to say. I echo that and that 
the numbers don't lie, y'all. So embrace assessment. Um, and then understanding the why, like who are all the players and understanding their role. And then again, that goes back to understanding how the machine works, you know? And so thinking about that, seeking to understand approach, you know, talking with your supervisor, have, if you have that opportunity, have an audience with your director, executive director, um, the AVP or VP, Dean of Students, whoever is the reporting arm of that, what are the priorities? And be okay with an understanding, and this was a hard pill for me to swallow, I may have an agenda and things uh, that are important, but if it, uh, if it doesn't align with what my boss's agenda is, I need to let that go give up that ghost and move on okay because you can you you're beating a dead horse at that point because your priorities unfortunately need to be your vp's priorities you adopted those you know and then if there's room to make room for the things that you excited and want to cheer you know cheerlead on then so be it and that is the understanding of how the machine works. And if you don't like that, then you need to make moves and work with your team to get you in the seat so that that way you are then setting the agenda. Thank y'all so much. Um, as I get ready to present this second question, um, we had someone that is eight months in the game and they blatantly asked, how do I get connected to these women? So within your level of comfort, whatever content information y'all want to share in the chat so that folks can copy and paste. Um, thank you for that person that asked the question one. And two, thank you all for being willing and able to like help them to build the network that they currently are looking for. Um, but the second question that I see is, how does balancing or how do you balance holding people accountable um, primarily speaking to upper leadership versus deciding which battles to fight. Um, so this one has some interesting layers, um, but it says, how do you balance holding people accountable, primarily upper leadership versus deciding which battles to fight? Um, and if the person does feel comfortable providing additional clarification in case y'all are like, I, I think I'm getting it, but I'm not sure, uh, feel free to unmute yourself, but I'm reading verbatim. How do you balance like, how do you balance holding people accountable, um, primarily speaking to upper leadership versus deciding which battles to fight? I'm happy to jump in and maybe just offer a few things. One, I think learning that, like, maybe it's not our job to, like, hold upper leadership accountable. Like, my job isn't to hold my boss accountable or our VP accountable. Like, my job is to, like, try to make the best experience in my locus of control. And so I, you know, like I think Dominique stated earlier, the numbers don't ever lie. So I feel like if you're excellent at your job, you're producing, nobody can deny that. And I just believe that, like, people will see and learn, like, when you're not doing good work or other people around you aren't doing good work. I don't need to make other people around me look bad. They they make themselves look bad on their own. I'm just gonna keep shining my little light and you know keep doing my work and that sort of thing. And so sometimes I think we're like so focused on like what's happening above when I think, what can I do in, in res ed? Like what, how can I make the experience great for my staff, my RAs, my department that I have control over? Like. The university is making the decisions the university is making. And maybe if I get to that role one day, I'll have, um, you know, an influence in that. But I can't be so preoccupied with that that I don't take care of home, which is like my department. Um, also, like whatever is in your control is in your control and what is not is not. And so if it is something institutional wise, it might not be. But if it has something to do, um, like you said, with the resident curriculum, or maybe it can have something to do with my student staff or my professional staffs and their training, then that's what I'm going to do, right? Because it's in my control. Um, and so just figuring out, okay, is this in my control? Probably not. Is this in my control over here? It is. So how can we make that work for um, my staff to continue to grow um, in their endeavors as well? My friends and I just recently had this conversation on our podcast, the meeting after the meeting. It's about seven of us. We are Black. We have made our way from RDs to cross industry and either a director or associate director or AVP. And we, we like, how did we get here? And we need each other. Um, 
understand it. Right. You can find us on all streaming platforms. They will want me to plug TM, ATM, pod. So follow us on, on Twitter, Instagram, all the things, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, all that. So I know that if you are at that point, um, and I think the pandemic has taught us that, if understanding that if this job and the leadership and the vision is no longer aligning and serving you, let me make that graceful exit and go. You know, because as Paige said, they're going to have that job posted faster than you in the grant, you know, um, and know that that is okay in terms of the accountability. Also recognize that just like you're human, your leadership is human, and they also have somebody that they're reporting to, and they may have their goals and vision, and if the president or the CFO or somebody else makes some different decisions, then unfortunately, that means that their vision or what they said that they were going to do is going to also change, and unfortunately, because we, and this is the same thing, we talk to our RAs and our student leaders, you only see it from here. Then we have an elevated view and we see it from here. And then there is a blind spot for even for us. And so understanding that that sometimes has a, a lot to do with it. And so if the money ain't there, then a lot of things gonna shake up and a lot of things are gonna change. And so understanding the balance of that, and then if it's happened repeatedly, then prepare for your exit and, and find somewhere else. Because what is not, Paige said, it's 900 some odd jobs on higher ed jobs, go be great, <laughs> you know, if you have the capacity to do so. And, you know, again, work with your board of directors, your team to be able to figure out the language that you need to be able to bring up these things that are concerns for you um, and what is reasonable, you know, what is reasonable, what is a, a appropriate timeline or timing to be able to ask, because it may be your problem, but it might not be the right time to bring that up. And so understanding what the forecast is of your space and what's going on in your division, your department, et cetera, um, as to why that happened. You can always ask some, ask some questions, you know, help me understand why, how we got here or why we're here. And then what is my place with helping to move this forward or get back in alignment? I love this, y'all. Uh, when I, I wish I could turn back the hands of time so we can keep it going, but we are getting to time. Um, so what I wanted to do is to give you all an opportunity to give that person or persons their flowers. We talked about the network, right? We talked about our mentors. Um, I love saying people's names. Um, so if each of you don't mind taking the time to just share that name out loud into this space. It could be one person, it could be two persons. Um, that's how I would love for us to wrap up this time together. And as y'all are doing that, for the questions I didn't get to, we are copying and storing for a part two. Heads up, um, be prepared, get excited. Um, because I would love for this conversation to continue um, in a space like this and beyond y'all. Don't feel like it has to stop when we leave this space, connect. Um, shout out to the Connect Hub that Kayla put in the chat. But whoever wants to spark off, I see Paige and then Dr. Karkari. So we can go from left to right. Um, who are those people that you are like, this is a flower that I'm going to give to? And second challenge, email or call them, let them know. Happy Women's History Month, y'all. <laughs> but thank y'all for doing that. I think I'm going first. So I'm giving flowers to someone in this space or just in the field? In the field. In the field, uh, yes. Okay, right now, I recognize they are not a woman or they do not identify as a woman right now. So I'm sorry, y'all. But the first person who comes to mind is my last supervisor at my last school. And so Dr. David Hiblin has been just really instrumental in my girlfriend development and definitely sits on my board of directors. So shout out to him. I'm gonna make sure I text him today. Um, thank y'all for joining this space and like definitely like stay connected. I know we didn't get to this, but like building your network, like you, like we all we got. So, um, but I want to give my flowers to Dr. Vicka Bell Robinson. We call her VBR the superstar. She's the director of residence life at Miami University, my former supervisor, mentor. I just cannot say she's a black woman that is like doing the damn thing. She has such an example, such a support. If you don't know her, you need to get to know her. She's incredible and honestly, like, is the reason I sit here today. And so I am just super grateful for her and the role she's played in my life.
I can go real fast. I want to give mine to Dr. D. Allard. So she's our executive director here at Mississippi State. And it has been like amazing working with her directly under her now. And so I've just been learning a lot from her, getting nuggets from her. I even ask her about, if I can ask her about anything, she she's willing to help me, support me, even bring me care packages when I took my comps, you know, like a cute little candle. So it's just those things for me that goes a long way because she see the work that I do and how much I put into what I do. And so I like to give my flowers to her. I would like to give my flowers to Ms. Jessica Day. She was in my Akuai internship, which was what got me into housing. Um, she sort of took me out. That was my first time ever working in housing. Um, and so I truly appreciate had she gave me and has given me over the Um, I would like to give my flowers to uh, one woman is Ashley Wilson. Um, she actually, she was assistant director of our university um, center. And so when I had first got to UT Tyler, it was not too many of us black women just here in general on staff. And so she kind of took me up under her wings, although she wasn't in housing and residence life and really built a community for me um, to be able to be myself. And then I would love to give my flowers to uh, Patrice Withers. She's not in the field. She's actually in banking, but she's my mentor and she's always there to support me. And I appreciate you for being here, Patrice. So I'm giving you my flowers now. Deanna, you was wrong for this question, okay? I just cause so I'm, many I know. <laughs> how do you how do you narrow that down? Okay, so I one in the room because she texted me at the beginning. Doctor Holmes in the house, um, and she is in the space right now. Want to definitely give her flowers. Uh, my sister, my Sara, uh, always checking in and can give. I can give a call and you know answer that. Uh, Crystal Lay, um, she is soon to be Dr. Crystal Lay uh, with that. We um, have kind of come up together. Um, my Some of my podcast crew members, Dr. LaFerra Merriweather and Bobby Denise Cole um, and Dr. Lori Patton Davis and Dr. Mary Howard Hamilton, just to name a few. We already dropped the Dr. Vicka Bell Robinson. Um, and it's just so many that list goes on and on, but there are some dynamic women. Um, and I will also say Dr. Nikhil Burwell. So my Black Sap sister, my co-founder, um, if you are not in Black Sap, answer the questions, submit the request, follow us also on social media, um, as that has been a, 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 that's my job nobody pays us for, it is just me and Nikhil, so you post and it's a delay, that's why, because it's just two of us, um, for that create that space for Black professionals every day and within the higher ed arena. Thank y'all so much for making the time to pour into this group in this space. Um, I'm looking at the direct messages. So offline, we'll be chatting about some ways to just keep the conversation going. Um, I'm excited for our newer professionals that are saying like, I just got into this and this is everything. Um, y'all, it's so many amazing, iconic, humble women. I knew it was gonna be hard. Um, but thank y'all for just like getting in the habit of doing that. Um, I hope that inspire other folks to continue to affirm even beyond Women's History Month. Like let's continue to affirm and give folks their flowers while they are alive and well. Um, but we will soon be working on getting the train continuing to go to the next station because I don't, I feel like it's so much more, right? And I know y'all know it's so much more. Um, so thank you again. Um, shout out to Kayla. I know she dropped the Connect Hub link. If y'all have not taken advantage of finding that link, um, be sure to do so. Um, I am going to continue to talk a little bit longer because I know we started at like the 306 minute for folks who are wanting to copy and paste the other things that are happening as well. If you want to be connected for the updates that are happening with the Black Professional Network, um, as well as the Women in Housing Network. Um, but I will yield the floor for our BPN friends if there's anything more you want to add in this moment uh, before we get to a place of officially saying until next time. I will go ahead and tap in for BPN. Hello, my name is Amber Stoltz. I am the chair elect. Um, Alexis is now our program 
chair and was integral in putting those panels together. So thanks to him. Shout out to Alexis working hard behind the scenes. And Taylor is also our programming chair. Um, we'll introduce ourselves more later and things of that nature. But quickly in the chat, there was, um, we want to start our mentorship program. We really saw the need from our Black Men in Housing panel we did in October and also this panel reinforce that we really need to continue this you know dialogue and the conversation and there's only so much we can do in a group space and really want to give people those opportunities to grow one-on-one -on -one and individually so um we'll be launching that uh, kickoff in april and there'll be other things like at a kuhuai for in-person meetup and we're working all, all the details now so stay tuned for that um, a multicultural symposium, this is all of Kuhuai, is also happening at the end of April, and the recordings um, for BPN, this is all really all of Kuhuai recordings, but this is a specific link to our BPN channel is listed, and you can access the different network channels from that. Um, let's see if you want to stay connected, you know, you can reach out to Kayla, thank you so much to everyone, I also posted the Kuhuai calendar and I want to make sure the Women in Housing Network, if you have any actual upcoming programs and things, you have a chance to do your announcements and any other BPN chairs, you can type any other updates or things I may have missed in the chat, trying to be concise with time. <laughs> All right, wonderful people. If there are not any other announcements, uh, updates, please continue to make it a great day. Uh, one day at a time, one moment at a time, sometimes one second at a time for folks who are in the grind seasons of onboarding, recruiting, training, come around the corner while trying to close for those that are still close to the building fund. Um, Thank you all for what you do for our profession beyond this time. And I look forward to continuing to engage with you all. Um, but that is all that we have. Um, find that link to the recording and share it out to folks on the In Case You Missed It tip and know that we'll be doing the same in our spaces. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.